by Soren Narnia. After not having much contact with him for the first 20 years of my life, I got to know my grandfather more and more. He and I had one very late dinner at his little house in the country one night, and afterwards we sat on his back porch as he smoked his pipe, just talking. I happened to ask him if he had any regrets in life, expecting him to talk about never having remarried or never opening his own clinic. He'd been a doctor all his life. Instead, he was quiet for a long moment and then said that to that very day, he held one very shameful secret inside and he finally felt safe enough to reveal it. He used that word specifically, safe. He said he regretted never telling the police that he was almost certain of the identity of a killer. Needless to say, I begged him to tell me the story, and with a lot of hesitation, he did. It was the year 1951, and my grandfather, whose name is John, was working at a rehabilitation center in Cumberland, Maryland. John woke up in bed one night in January to feel his heart pounding and a bizarre feeling of being very cold inside his skin, not on its surface. Alarmed, he got up and started pacing back and forth across his bedroom, trying to understand this feeling, like a panic attack but with more unusual symptoms. Before it fully subsided, he happened to look out his window at his front yard and the winding road beyond it. There was someone standing there at the curb. It was a little before two in the morning and it had begun to snow very lightly. John put on his robe and his shoes and opened his front door. The woman out there didn't move. She was holding one arm up at her side in a strange way. John called out, but she didn't answer. As he moved closer to her, he heard a small sound and realized that the woman was wearing little finger bells and she was clinging them softly as she stood in the snow. She wore tattered shoes and a ragged brown dress. She looked very young, in her twenties, and had a plain face and unstylish hair. John asked if he could help her, but she only looked at him and clanged her little bells. She wasn't shivering at all. She seemed to want to be where she was, but he told her to follow him inside so he could call someone to come get her. She followed willingly enough as she spoke very soft words under her breath, not mumbling, but whispering. My grandfather remembered that the bizarre symptoms he'd suffered just minutes earlier had disappeared quickly upon venturing out into the night. He asked this woman some questions, but she didn't answer any of them, except one. When he asked her if she needed something to eat, she said, I swallowed a farmer's eye in Lancaster. And then she opened her mouth wide as if to show him. Her mouth was empty, and she closed it again and smiled strangely. She clanged her finger bells and followed John to the guest room. His plan, if he couldn't get any information out of her, was to just keep her safe and dry and call a friend at County Hospital to drive over in an ambulance as soon as dawn came. He didn't own a car himself, and he never has since. She sat on the bed, and she told him that she would try to go to sleep, but that sometimes they shook her head about. There came no inclination of who they were. John asked her once more if there was someone he could call. To this, she responded that she was not even close to being who he thought she was. She said, you make me laugh. And then she threw her head back and did so. And that laugh was what first made my grandfather scared to be in the house with her. The voice that came out of her throat was first her own, but then suddenly seemed to belong to a small child and then a different woman entirely. He compared it to an audio montage made by a sound editor. He stared at her, waiting for her to say something more, but she closed her eyes and lay down on the bed and sounded her bells again. He went back upstairs, but he couldn't go to sleep after that. After this odd physical malady and having the stranger on the floor below him, it wasn't going to happen. He sat in a chair and smoked and watched the snow fall outside, wondering what would happen if it accumulated so much that the ambulance couldn't come. 
Two hours passed and his eyes were getting heavier and heavier when he heard the shaking of those finger bells again, and it didn't sound like they were coming from the guest room. They seemed closer. The sound came just once. John got up and opened his bedroom door very slowly and went out into the hall. He thought the sound had come from as close as the bottom of the staircase, but the woman wasn't there. He stood in that same spot for a full half hour, waiting, but for all he knew, the stranger was asleep again. He went down the stairs as soon as the sky began to lighten. He called the hospital from the kitchen, and the ambulance was promised in about 20 minutes. It would have been 10, but the snow was really falling now. The wind was picking up. John waited on the back porch, closing the door behind him, not wanting to even check on the woman. When the ambulance arrived, proceeding very carefully up the drive, John went out and told the driver, a man named Patrick Edelston, that no gurney was needed. The woman could walk under her own power, and she just needed an evaluation. The two men went to the house, and John knocked on the guest room door. When there was no answer, he opened it. The woman was gone. They both checked the whole house, though there was nowhere for her to have gone. Edelston trotted back to the ambulance to call back in. John went through the kitchen and stepped out onto the back lawn, which was under four inches of snow now. He immediately saw footprints leading across the yard toward the woods. He began to follow them, moving as fast as he could, though the wind and the snow in his face and the slippery footing made it difficult. Once or twice as he went, he had to stop just to lower his head and peer closer to the ground because the darkness wasn't retreating very quickly. He spotted the stranger a few hundred yards into the woods near the bank of a small stream. As soon as John saw her moving away from him, he shouted and she stopped and turned. She waited for him to approach. She smiled and took a step towards him. John remembered that the wind had blown her hair into her mouth and it had caught there, so it appeared almost as if she were eating it. He had to lean in to hear what she said to him, which was just a single sentence. I'll make you remember me and all that I can do, she said. And she suddenly raised her left arm and swung it toward him in a swooping arc. He felt her hand connect with his right cheek hard, and then, unfathomably, he swore as an old man that he had felt her fingers puncture his cheek entirely, tearing right through the flesh, and he could feel her fingertips touch his teeth and those cold little bells digging against his face and the open wound. For one second of mortal shock and panic, he stood there as she laughed and pushed her fingers deeper through his cheek, seeming to feel for his tongue. He flinched back instinctively, and her hand withdrew, and he felt his cheek become whole again in an instant. There was no blood, no nothing. It had never really happened. The woman turned and began to run through the snow, and this time, John did not follow her. He sank to his knees in a panic, feeling his face. There was nothing wrong with it. The woman disappeared into the mist, and a minute later, Edelson was behind him, helping him to his feet. It took an hour or so for my grandfather to tell me that part of the story, sitting there on his back porch. He filled his pipe again and sighed heavily. He had never told this to anyone. Not even Edelston on that morning that it all happened. He wondered if he should stop. I didn't pressure him, and he eventually went on. There was a real search for the woman, but it couldn't amount to much, as 16 inches of snow eventually fell that day, and the area was stifled. She had vanished. That began the time when my grandfather would see her in his dreams. These were the worst nightmares he'd ever had. But eventually, they did begin to fade. One morning, almost a year after his encounter with the woman, he woke up inexplicably cold 
and almost went into a state of panic before he realized he was cold, not as some sort of premonition that she had returned, but because he'd left a window open. He couldn't forget that feeling of having been freezing inside his skin, as if his organs had suddenly been coated in ice. More than once, his dreams took the form of reliving his first hour with the woman, from the moment he'd seen her standing on the border between the road and his drive. But in the dream, when she said she'd eaten the eye of a farmer in Lancaster and opened her mouth to show him, he woke up stifling a scream because now it was obvious that she truly had. There were other waking moments when my grandfather was haunted. Once he was on a train to Manhattan to visit his brother and the train had to stop in New Jersey with an engine problem a little after dark. It was sitting on the tracks in the middle of Levitt Town And he looked out the window, and he saw a woman sitting on a bench under a streetlight more than a hundred yards away. He couldn't make out her face, but for some reason, he was immediately convinced that it was her. She never moved until the train pulled away again, ten minutes later. He couldn't say what it was that made him think it was her. He just felt it with every fiber of his being. Shortly after that trip, he fell into a depression that had lasted almost three years and whose cause he could never quite pinpoint. In 1958, seven years after the night of that snowstorm in Cumberland, John was contacted by the Ohio State Police about a murder case that was being investigated in Youngstown. By that time, he was considered an expert in abnormal psychology and was occasionally called upon to testify in court as such. Now a detective who knew of his work wanted to send him a stack of paperwork that represented evidence collected so far in the killing of Father Owner Corvett, a 40-year-old Catholic priest. Half the evidence consisted of photographs of the crime scene. Because the material was too sensitive to send through the mail, the detective asked if he could drive out and meet John at a hotel near the western Maryland border, where John was at a convention of clinicians. He agreed, and over coffee, the detective... Terence Brunner gave him the materials and told him more about the case. Back at his hotel room in the small hours of the night, my grandfather first read Father Corvett's diary, which hadn't been kept regularly, but twice mentioned his attempts to help a homeless woman who had recently appeared in Youngstown. She was mute, he believed, and traumatized, but docile and apparently harmless. For some reason, the priest never referred to her by name, only as the Snake Lady. It had taken Brunner quite some time to determine the origin of this nickname, which had only been revealed in a single letter Corvett had written to his sister. The first time he'd seen the homeless woman, she'd been standing under a tree on church grounds. He'd spoken to her briefly, then gone back inside the church. When he came back out an hour later and walked to his car, He noticed that she was gone, but that something was lying under that same tree, in the grass. Closer investigation revealed it to be a long, thick, grayish-brown snake, a dead one, that looked quite exotic and put a real fright into Corvette. He drove the carcass directly to animal control, which, with the help of a nearby university, later identified it as a puff adder, considered Africa's deadliest snake, one that should not exist outside of it. There wasn't much more detail than that about the snake lady. The striking thing about the diary was Father Corvett's writings about his travels to various libraries in the area, travels which got more extensive and expansive as they went on. His reasons for them were maddeningly vague, and so Detective Brunner had looked into the priest's materials checkout records at scholarly libraries and theological seminaries. He was able to detect a pattern. The man kept checking books out farther and farther away from his home on subjects ranging from drug addiction and schizophrenia to witchcraft. One weekend, Corvett came to a seminary in Philadelphia from which he withdrew books about ancient religious beliefs centered around the Middle East. At one point, he'd requested photocopies of two essays from the late 1900s describing the obscure belief among some Babylonian tribes that the souls of the dead 
could congregate inside a single living human body for the purpose of resurrecting it. The timeline of his research coincided with the homeless woman's arrival in town, according to various people who had briefly seen Corvette in conversation with her. From there, John started going through the stack of crime scene photographs. The scene was the church where Father Corvette conducted his services. In the wide shot of the interior, taken from the back of the church, it seemed totally empty. Though looking hard, one could see that all the way in the first row of pews, a man was sitting, facing forward. The other photos showed this was Father Corvett, who'd been killed with two knife wounds to the heart, only slightly slumped over, as if he'd been sitting on the pew turned partially sideways, perhaps speaking to someone sitting beside him. He'd simply never fallen over. There were, my grandfather said, more than 150 photographs of him in this position. Looking more closely at the little details of each, he saw writing on the seat of the pew, about 24 inches away from Corvett's left hand, small writing that had been done in pencil, almost looking like a child had been bored. The police knew of the writing, but did not know its origin. The style of the letters, which spelled out completely nonsensical, unconnected words, made my grandfather set the photos aside and light his pipe to calm himself. He called Terence Brunner to see if maybe he had not yet left the area. He hadn't. My grandfather left his hotel in order to walk the 12 blocks across downtown Grantsville to the police station where Brunner was meeting with a colleague. He needed to talk to the man in person because he recognized the letters the killer had printed on that pew from some faint writing his night visitor had made on the windowsill of his guest room in 1951. She'd taken a pen off a table and done it, making just three or four words out of nothing and putting odd-looking accents over the H's and V's. The streets were very quiet. My grandfather was walking across the little town square when everything around him started to lose its color all at once. The color bleeding out of every tree and street sign and car parked against the curb, and he began to feel sick to his stomach. He was seized with a heavy dry cough, and he made his way to the closest bench, sat down, and put his head between his knees to settle down. A profound sense of dread then came over him, he sensed that something truly awful was about to happen to him, and he had just raised his head to look up and around to see if perhaps there was someone else on the street or a public place he could run toward to feel safe, when suddenly his head was flung back, then forward again, as if an unseen hand had grabbed it, forward and back, forward and back, until his neck was almost snapping, his head whipping up and down. He tried to scream, but he couldn't. He had lost all control of his body, which was almost flying off the park bench with the force of this bizarre seizure. It lasted only about five seconds, and then, dizzy and in great pain, he fell off the bench and onto the grass. No one saw his agonies. After a minute, he stood up, trying to regain his balance. Somehow he knew, he told me, that as long as he didn't take another single step toward the police station to tell them what he knew, he would be all right. He turned and began to walk back in the other direction, back where he came from, and with every step he took, more color came back into the world around him, and the pain in his neck subsided. Soon he began to run, and he was back into the lobby of his hotel in just a couple of minutes. The desk clerk offered to call an ambulance, but my grandfather said no. He told the clerk that if anyone called to be put through to his room, he should tell them he had been taken ill. He made his way upstairs and collapsed on his bed, and he remembered weeping, knowing that he could never tell anyone about the woman, ever. He would send back the crime scene evidence without a note. By intending to speak of that woman and perhaps sending the police after her, he felt he had enraged something that was in control of her. He vowed at that moment never to speak of her to anyone, for any reason, in the hope that he would be left alone. That night was the longest of his life, 
as he lay there and waited for that invisible hand to maybe return to strike him, strangle him, kill him. He went to church for the first time in his life two weeks later, and he fully embraced Catholicism that summer. He never stopped. That's where his story of the woman ended. Decades passed and nothing truly strange ever happened to him again. He wanted to correlate his peace with the events to his acceptance of spirituality, but he wasn't sure about it. He thought perhaps it was more about his refusal to act on his suspicions. He felt something sensed that he wasn't a threat. As he grew older, his memories of the terrible thing began to fade, blessedly, just like any other memories. He told me life was so long, so very long, that the human mind could learn to endure and bury almost anything. This world was populated by people who had lost children in accidents and Holocaust survivors. But when life reached a certain duration, these things slowly, slowly faded. No matter how much they shook our beliefs, time inevitably did its work. And even though your experiences would never allow you to be the same, those slow decades labored in the dark field of the subconscious to overcome them. He dedicated himself to his work and his new family, and he simply never told anyone about what had happened. Until that night when he was 71, and he told me about it there on his back porch. I was speechless for several minutes. Finally, I asked him if he felt unburdened or, just maybe, worried that telling the story held some power. He shook his head firmly, said no, he didn't think so. All that had ended almost 40 years ago. The fact that he had never encountered anything of a supernatural nature again led him to believe that he was safe from such things. And maybe, just maybe, there was an explanation of the events that lay deep within parts of his mind he'd never explored. Still, I told myself on that night that the secret would stay with me, which was only partially to honor him. Some of that vow was due to my own fears of the unknown, the specters that the story had raised of a realm beyond my understanding. It was just better not to speak of it. I felt safer. The story was told to me in the year 1993. In 2012, my grandfather was 90 years old. We'd remained close, though I'd since graduated from college and gone on to have my own career as a doctor. I still visited him every year at Christmas. He continued to live on his own in Solomons, Maryland, a four-hour drive from Cumberland. One day last December, I arrived there to stay for a couple of days, and we exchanged presents and had dinner like always. He was very healthy and of sound mind, the result of a very studious and disciplined living. I took him out to a nice restaurant in town the night after Christmas. I had to start driving back to Boston afterward. We got in the car at the restaurant and drove to his house. I remember that he had forgotten to lock his front door, which was not a big deal as he sometimes just didn't bother. Where he lived was very safe. We went into the house and he told me to go down to the basement and take a box of toys there back to my niece and nephew. I went down the stairs into the unfinished basement. There was virtually nothing down there but a big table and a chair and boxes and boxes of mementos. When I turned on the light, which hung from a chain, I saw that something had been written on the gray cement wall on the east side of the room. It looked like it had been scrawled in white chalk. I stared at those words, at first not understanding what they meant, because the first few of them were nonsensical scribbling, letters a foot high that didn't make sense. But below that, there was an actual sentence. The word said, Can you hear the bells? A question. A feeling of such terror washed over me. I almost lost consciousness right there and then. I heard my grandfather's feet on the stairs above me, and I called out for him to stop. But something about the tone of my voice so frightened made him come farther. And so he and I both stood and looked at what was written on the wall. His face was stony. I could see where the white chalk had come from. It had been taken from a plastic tub of it that was one of the presents my grandfather had bought for my niece and nephew. He said to me, it can't be, it can't be. Without saying a word, I guided him back to the staircase 
and led him upwards, holding his arm tight so he wouldn't fall. We got to the top of the steps and walked quickly to the front door. We hadn't turned on the house lights yet, except for the one in the kitchen, and I could feel the darkness pressing in on us terribly. The move to the door seemed to take forever. I didn't look left or right for fear of what I might see. I ushered Grandpa to the car and opened the door for him, and he got in. I slammed the door shut fast and I trotted around to the driver's side, and I tried to make it so that Grandpa wouldn't notice me quickly glance into the back seat in case something was there. Only when the doors were locked and the engine started did I feel safe. Grandpa asked me where we were going and I said, I didn't know. He said, maybe she's still here somewhere, and I nodded and we pulled out of the driveway. It was my intent to start driving us toward Boston, and we would never come back. Never. I wouldn't let him. Three turns through the neighborhood was a street called Peach Run, the road just a single lane, very quiet, and my headlights picked up a figure up ahead, a human figure. It was a small woman moving away from us. When the headlights splashed across her back, and flowed past her and she was caught in that circle of light. She stopped. When she did, I did too, hitting the brakes. I looked for a second at my grandfather in the dark. His eyes were wide, staring through the windshield. The woman turned towards us, and then she began to walk toward the car. I told Grandpa not to move, but he had no intent of doing so. The woman was old so very old. Her hair was long and dirty, and she wore a plain dress that was almost more like a sack. She was wearing old tennis shoes. When she walked, it was with a marked limp. My eyes went to her left hand, and there they were. There were the bells, except that they'd become so old and rusted over the decades that they seemed to be a permanent part of her flesh, which was blackened all around them. There must have been a deep infection at one point, untreated, and now her hands and the bells were one mutated object. They made not a sound now. It had been 63 years since my grandfather had heard them in the middle of the night as he sat in his room, frightened of the same woman who had never forgotten him. She looked even older than her years, ancient, as sick as it's possible for a living human being to look. But at least she was mortal. She had aged, and eventually she would have to die, freed of whatever controlled her, freed of whatever horrible things she had done over a stretch of time so long I can barely conceive of it. Where had she traveled? Who had she killed without anyone ever locking her away somewhere for good? She staggered forward, three more steps, until we could see every detail of her withered body. She had no expression on her face, only stared blankly like a statue. I heard Grandpa emit a small wheeze as he began to have more difficulty breathing. I took my foot off the brake and hit the gas pedal then, and we swerved around her and sped up, and I took a sudden right turn that led us to the main road. When we got there, I drove us well over the speed limit to the highway, and we were on it in three minutes. I kept saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And Grandpa said nothing, nor did he say anything for almost two hours when we finally pulled into a gas station. I turned off the radio and he sat with tears in his eyes, gripping the door handle tightly. Finally, he said he was all right, that he was okay, and he was. He died six months ago of viral pneumonia, only eight months after leaving his house that night, which neither of us ever returned to. He moved in with me and my wife and my kids, who were only too happy to have him. We told them there had been a terrible flooding in his house. I let a real estate agent handle every detail of the sale. So my grandfather would never be left alone. I hired a full-time assistant to help him around the house, even though he didn't need it. He accepted the helper without complaint. And how many nights have I spent wondering how long it will take for that woman to die so that there's no chance I'll be walking alone one night and feel her presence and turn and see that she somehow found her way to Boston 
wanting to demonstrate to me that she is not who I think she is. I'm not as mentally strong as my grandfather. I know it. I know my mind would break if she were to touch me, if she were to reach out to me in the dark with a hand that had fused with bells that would never sound again. <laughs> 